Newton's law of universal gravitation is shown here in equation form. The gravitational force between Earth and Moon is easily calculated by putting the masses of each and the distance between their centers into this equation, along with Newton's gravitational constant g. A question arose in the minds of many investigators of science during Newton's time and after, that is, how is it possible for two objects such as the Earth and the Moon to interact when not in contact with each other? Newton himself couldn't imagine an influence reaching out through nothingness. Today we look at the concept of a force field. The Moon interacts with the gravitational field of planet Earth. Surrounding Earth and every body with mass is a gravitational force field. We show the field with sample lines of force, in orange, that emanate from Earth, originating at Earth's center, not indicated here, and emanating outward indefinitely. <clears throat> we'll return to force fields when we study electricity, where we'll see the importance of the electric field in electrical interactions. When a bit of mass is in the vicinity of Earth, it experiences a force. This is the force due to gravity as expressed in our equation for gravity. If we divide this force by the mass of the object being pulled, let's call it m sub 1, we get g multiplied by m sub 1 times the mass of the Earth divided by the radial distance squared, all divided by m sub 1 which after canceling the m sub 1's equals g mass of the earth divided by radial distance square. Now here's the interesting part. Recall from previous lessons that f over m is Newton's second law for acceleration and that the acceleration due to gravity at earth's surface is 10 meters per second square. If we plug Earth's mass and its radius and the gravitational constant g into this equation, we get 10 newtons per kilogram, or more precisely, 9.8 newtons per kilogram. We know the acceleration due to gravity at Earth's surface has this value. Recall that newtons per kilogram is equivalent to meters per second square. Yum confirmation of what we've previously learned. Now we can define the strength of Earth's gravitational field at any radial distance as g equals g, mass of the Earth, divided by radial distance squared, where we used bold-faced g as the symbol for Earth's gravitational field. g, like acceleration, is a vector quantity and is strongest at Earth's surface and weakens with increasing distance from Earth's center via the inverse square law. Let's look at how distance affects Earth's gravitational field. We construct a graph of field strength versus distance from Earth's center. Red letter R shows the Earth's radius. As said, the field is maximum at Earth's surface. We plot this point with a purple dot. At a distance twice Earth's radius, the field is one quarter as strong as at the surface. Another purple dot. At a distance three times Earth's radius from the center, it's one ninth as strong, and so forth. We connect the dots and see a graph that clearly illustrates the inverse square law. An interesting question. What would be the strength of the field in a small cavity in Earth's center? Can you see that a mass placed there, orange dot, would be pulled equally in all directions? Since force is a vector quantity, can you see that the forces there would cancel to zero? And hence the gravitational field at Earth's center would be zero? That's correct. Earth's gravitational field at its center is zero. So another dot on our graph at the zero point. Consider a vertical shaft down to a point halfway to Earth's center. 
To progress further, let's assume Earth's density is uniform throughout, although it's really denser with depth. Ah, this gets interesting. A small mass halfway to Earth's center, shown by the orange dot, would be pulled downward by Earth's mass below, but upward in all directions by masses in regions above R over 2. I'm taking a shortcut and telling you what happens here. It so happens that the pulls by Earth's mass at radial distances above the halfway point, R over 2, cancel. That's right, the resulting gravitational force acting on a mass at the bottom of the shaft is due only to Earth mass below the R over 2 region. Earth's gravitational field halfway to its center is half what it is at the top of the shaft, at Earth's surface. We plot this dot at half maximum field strength and half Earth's radius, R. The gravitational field between the surface and center for a uniform density Earth is linear, so our graph shows a straight line for the field within Earth. So if you apply the equation for Newton's law of gravity inside Earth, or calculate Earth's gravitational field inside Earth, the mass you use is the mass in the sphere below radius r over 2, which I show with this cross-hatching. And at the center, where r equals 0, where there's no Earth mass below you, and where forces in every direction cancel out, Earth's field is 0. So there's no field at the center due to the mass comprising planet Earth. But suppose a giant massive spaceship landed on Earth's surface. If you were in a cavity at Earth's center, would you know about it? It turns out the answer is yes. You'd be gravitationally attracted to the spaceship as if Earth's mass didn't exist. So Earth's mass, or any mass at all, doesn't shield gravitational force. Not at all. Is this interesting or what? I'm covering a lot of ground here, and you may work out the math to confirm what we've covered. In the next lesson, we'll consider a tunnel bored completely through Earth, and what would happen if you fell into such a tunnel. For now, I want to leave you with a question. In a cavity at Earth's center, do you experience the gravitational pull of the sun? Think about that. Until next time, good energy. Mm -hmm.